respected principal father john coordinator shri gopinath my <coughs> dear old friend paul kalinar <coughs> mr neeraj who introduced me and all the respected teachers and students of this institution and the plus 2 courses i'm very happy to be here in the midst of young students they must be full of curiosity in fact <coughs> as a teacher i have always learned more from my students than from books sometimes when they put very inconvenient questions of which i didn't have the answer that provoked me to read further and to try to understand questions problems deeply is in fact the questions and problems which my students <coughs> freely put before me that encourage me to search for new directions and try to understand more about our past as you know there is no <coughs> real subject as history final real objective perfect history that is not there <coughs> it is anybody's dream but <coughs> you 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 never reach finality in your <coughs> understanding of the past simply because uh, we are only human beings <coughs> we don't have <coughs> the divine power to see the past before us we can't recall the past <coughs> or reproduce it in any form uh, we try to understand it from what our ancestors have left and what <coughs> time has left uh in the course of centuries that's all say if you think of uh, 1000 AD or 800 AD or uh, some time in the in some time before Christ whatever we have is only a, a thousandth part of the information which those people our ancestors or <laughs> other ancestors of other peoples had during their lifetime so how they lived what they thought how they behaved what they believed all these things are <laughs> mostly to be inferred from the fragments of uh, information which they have uh put in writing and of their writing also only what has survived the onslaught of time <coughs> is before us and you go through it you will find that some <coughs> writers were trying to be impartial and objective but most others travelers or <coughs> local people had their own narrow outlook and interest they were biased they had their own little problems so we have to judge them from what we have uh, before us and in this judgment we are likely to uh, go wrong that's why i said that's why many <laughs> scholars have stated in that history is only a continuing dialogue with the past 
you never reach the conclusion, you never reach finality. No historian is perfect because after all he is only a human being like you and me. And we are using our limited powers and skills um, to examine the uh, relics of old buildings, maybe palaces or churches uh, <coughs> or schools or colleges, theatres, etc. Uh, we examine them, try to understand their style of architecture, their <coughs> purpose when they were built, how they were used and then <coughs> what paintings or sculptures they have uh, left for posterity. That's all. That's only an infinitely small portion of what existed at a time. So millions of people have lived on this good earth, which is the gift of God and nature to us. Uh, when you look at the past, you feel uh, humbled. You feel <coughs> how small a person you are, how <coughs> insignificant we are today. Because tomorrow there will be other people, we will be leaving this world and then others will judge us. In the same way, we try to judge our predecessors. So history is a very complex, challenging, inviting uh, subject which has no end <coughs> any time, anywhere. As uh, students, you must have uh, learned from your textbooks and your teachers. A bit of it, <coughs> as far as our country is concerned and other countries are concerned. When we were students in my generation, we didn't have the facilities that you have today. Uh, in the schools, in, the, in high school, uh, I didn't like my history lessons or textbooks or teachers for a simple reason that they were full of years and names which didn't speak to us, which didn't convey to us anything interesting to us. We didn't share their feelings or their experiences or their sentiments only dry, bare <coughs> facts about years and personalities were presented to us. There, there was a very simple method of classifying the rulers. If a good ruler, king or emperor, he is one who introduced social reforms and um, created good roads, uh, then um, planted trees on either side of the Roles, things like that, you know. There is a formula for that. If he's a bad ruler, he was um, very intolerant, cruel, and uh, unjust, often like that, and uh, waged many wars and accomplished uh, conquests, etc., etc. So that kind of classification is black and white, and names and years, <coughs> which didn't have any meaning for us. That was what we were taught and there was no uh, history of our own small area of uh, habitation, Kerala, nothing like that. South India did not figure as such. India, yes, there's just one uh, <coughs> book on Indian history, but more, mostly we were studied, we were taught uh, before independence, uh, history of England. English history and world history were the uh, most important subjects of history. Again, languages and personalities, things, geographical conditions about which we had no real <coughs> understanding. So I, uh, I uh, and our teachers went on dictating notes. They were dictators, not teachers actually, mostly. And, uh, Often we slept in the class or created uh, unrest in the class 
that way. I like the mathematics as my favorite subject and there was a system of uh, <coughs> choosing a subject as your option subject for the high school classes. I opted for mathematics and did well. But then after that, when I had to be admitted in the college, my father, who was a physician, doctor, he didn't ask me as to what I liked or I wanted in, in the good old days. People never asked their daughters as to whom they wanted to marry. So they fixed the uh, bridegroom and conducted the marriage themselves. Likewise, in the case of uh, children also, they never asked as to what he or she liked or wanted to be. Just He just put me in the second group, which included sciences, uh, which could take me uh, to courses in medicine, because he was a doctor. Uh, following our ancestral caste system, doctors wanted their children to be doctors, lawyers, doc lawyers like that, you know. <coughs> engineers wanted their sons and daughters to be engineers like that. There was not much option. But then when I wandered about the college building, I looked into the laboratories and found skeletons there and frogs pasted onto the walls. I, I couldn't <laughs> like those things, you know. And the smell of sulfuric acid which filled the laboratories, uh, I hated that also. I couldn't see suffering or blood. <laughs> so I decided in my own way, in a very arrogant uh, manner perhaps, that I did not want to be in the second group. So I went to the principal when my father left. I went to the principal and told him, I don't want this second group, please uh, get me some other group. What group? I didn't know. Then he offered, he said, first group you can, you can, you have good marks, so you can take first group. That also I didn't like because though mathematics was there, there were other subjects uh, with the same kind of laboratories. Then he said, then there is only one option, that is history. I didn't like it. So I hesitated, but there was no other uh, alternative. Then I went into the history class and found that it was an interesting class <coughs> because uh, I had a teacher like uh, Professor K. V. Krishna Iyer, who wrote the first history of Calicut, Jamarins of Calicut in English back in 1938. I was there in 1947, just, India had just become independent and our teacher, when contrary to the general uh, practice, he did not dictate notes, he did not even lecture very much. On the other hand, he, he took us to temples and churches and palaces and museums, places like Tirunavai where the Mahamakam was held, introduced us to well-known personalities, poets, authors like that. So it was a very interesting experience and that way I started falling in love with the subject of history. I didn't know what prospects there were, nor did I think about it, nor did our generation of students know much about uh, the employment uh, facilities and future opportunities, like that. Anyway, and then in course of time, when I was a student in the intermediate class, I had my friends, some of them were political leaders, and um, they took me to study classes by the communist leaders. Uh, <coughs> And I learnt about uh, Marx and Karl Marx and Marxist literature. I learnt about many other things. In my uh, lower classes, I had learned the Bible. Uh, I studied in a Basel <coughs> mission school uh, where, my, uh, where one teacher uh, took a great interest in me and another friend taught us <laughs> Bible lessons with interesting stories the uh, four uh, books of the uh, New Testament, stories I liked and I scored high marks 
in the Bible class, Sunday classes, etc. So these were, this was my capital when I would become a student. Later on, I went on reading because ours was a small village uh, and my, aunt, my relatives didn't have any high ambition for me. I lost my mother early in my childhood. Uh, and so there was nobody to guide me properly. I went on reading. I, I really understood that reading was the only way in which to escape the uh, narrow outlook of uh, my people, my relatives who surrounded us. That way, that was an escape route which offered itself. I went on reading, making use of the local uh, village library and the school and college libraries. And by about, uh, by the time that I reached the postgraduate course, I liked history very much, but <coughs> decided that if ever I have anything to do with the teaching and the organization of history classes, I will try in my own way to change the way history is looked at and uh, uh, researched and published in my country. Luckily, I had plenty of opportunities. Uh, that way. I, I don't want to elaborate on that. Now, what I would like to do here is to invite questions from you. Uh, wherever you have a doubt, I may not be able to answer all your questions satisfactorily. But at least I, I, I can understand your level of information, vocabulary and interest. And uh, that way I can respond <laughs> and we can have a lively uh, conversation. That is what I prefer uh, to making a, a speech on history, uh, which may be very boring. So, please come out with your problems and questions, uh, whatever you like, whatever I know I can tell you, otherwise I can guide you to other sources of information, books and teachers and institutions which can help you in your pursuit of history. Uh, let me tell you in the beginning that uh, in Kerala history is very much underrated. But while I was in Delhi and in other countries, I learned that history was a very coveted subject. It was very difficult uh, for people to get admission to history courses. In, in Delhi, when I was in the Indian Council of Historical Research, uh, one of my <coughs> uh, colleagues came to me with a request uh, to interact with the uh, uh, colleges there and to get admission for his child, for his boy uh, in the history course. That is true. In, in Delhi colleges like um, St. Stephen's College or um, Lady Sri Ram College and people, there are many other colleges, they are good colleges. It's very, very difficult to get admission to the history course. A large number of students gather and apply and only very few are selected. <laughs> but unfortunately, in Kerala, it's just the reverse. Uh, the most useless students who do not do well in classes, they are admitted in history and they become history teachers. So with every new <laughs> generation, we have um, what is it, a decreasing uh, standard of knowledge and history. Our textbooks are very badly produced. While I was in England, I made some inquiries as to how history is taught there. I had to admit my son in a school and uh, then also I had to interact with uh, school teachers. They had a history teachers association in these schools. Uh, uh, that was the time when our uh, rulers were contemplating the uh, creation of history textbooks 
government textbooks in history for the NCERT courses. Uh, but <coughs> the practice in England was very, very different. The History Teachers Association, because most of the teachers were um, having research qualifications in the subject and they had an aptitude for teaching. They came into, into the field of teaching because they liked it, not because they didn't get any other job, not because they wanted a job near their house where they, they, they could get this big salary without any work, like that, you know. It was not like that. On the other hand, people who preferred to <coughs> learn and teach history uh, were uh, recruited as teachers and uh, their association had a practice of uh, inviting the best experts, say for example, uh, in European history, they had to teach um, subjects, topics like uh, industrial revolution maybe, or science, <coughs> reformation, etc. So what they did was to <coughs> select the best experts in the country in those areas and then to request one of their experienced teachers in those classes where this topic was to be taught and uh, form a team, the expert and the experienced teacher, they formed a team and wrote about 20-30 pages on that particular topic. So each topic in the syllabus got <coughs> a small booklet uh, jointly written by uh, an expert in, in the area and uh, an experienced teacher in that area. Uh, then it was there available for all teachers, they could take it or leave it, it could help them. I had one particular experience when I was in the University of London in 1974-75, which I used to repeat to many <laughs> student and teacher audiences. When I was working there as a Commonwealth uh, <coughs> Academic Staff Fellow for one year, uh, I, I used to go to the department on two days in the week, Wednesdays and Thursdays. That was the order. I mean, we, you were expected to be in the department for two days at least in the week, <coughs> so that um, students uh, and others can uh, contact you there. Otherwise, you were supposed to be spending your time doing research in the uh, big libraries, museums, etc. So one day, the secretary of the department, uh, she called me and told me that a <coughs> school girl wanted to have an appointment with me. But I said, okay. And she came in the afternoon on a Thursday or so, in with a uh, uniform like this. Maybe she was 10 or 11 years of age. She had a problem. In those days, nowadays of course in, in our schools also we have started giving projects to students and all that. Very often I, what I find is that the teachers <laughs> suggest the topics to the students and uh, they go to their parents or their neighbors or teachers whom they know and uh, try to get information from them or even if possible make them write for them and submit it that way. On the other hand, I found that in, in England boys and girls were having a lot of self-respect. They never wanted anything written by somebody else to be submitted in their name. They went on doing their search in the libraries and the teachers and the librarians helped them. So this girl um, had taken up a project, a part of a team project on the history of transport in the world. In England, she had never <laughs> come to India. In England, they had never seen uh, the roads and the vehicles in India. But she had um, learned from the books that bullock carts were the main uh, vehicles of uh, 
transportation and uh, movement of commodities along our roads. And then she also understood from the books that she had <laughs> that our roads had ups and downs, you know, many of them. They were not on flat ground, <laughs> but having ups and downs. Then in her little head, there was a question. How did the bullocks pull the carts when it was a steep descent on the road? Was there a break in the bullock cart? If there is no break, how did they manage? The <laughs> bullocks cannot resist the speed, so they will tumble down and perish. So was there a method <laughs> by which they could control the speed of the bullock cart when it was going down the road. This was a question which occurred to her. She consulted her teachers. They also did not know. I hope you know. You must be knowing the answer, isn't it? I used to put this question to many students and teachers. Please raise your hands, those who know whether the bullock cart in our country has a system of brakes or not. Please raise your hands. No one? No one? No one knows, is it? Then how do you think the bullock carts manage the speed, control the speed when you have to go down the road? Hmm? Do they always fall down and the bullocks perish? Then what? How do, they, how do they manage? I don't know. How, how? This is the answer which I got from many other <laughs> schools and colleges also. Neither the teachers nor the students had thought of it, but this small little uh, English girl in London who had never seen a bullock cart or even a horse cart because those things had vanished uh, in England. Um, she tried to imagine uh, the situation where <coughs> there were steep roads and find an answer, she approached her teacher, they didn't know, went to the library, then they suggested the county library, she didn't get an answer. Then she thought of a solution, why not contact the London University? There must be some Indian professor there who, who might be coming from India and as he, come, he or she comes from India, they must be knowing. That is why she had telephoned. In those days, uh, the mobiles and the computers, these things were absent, no network, nothing like that. Uh, it was in 1974, <coughs> 40 years back. Then she contacted the Department of Indology in our institution, which was known as School of Oriental and African Studies, which is formed a part of the London University. So you don't know the answer, is it? Is there, is there anybody who can think of it? No? Who had never seen? Have you seen a bullock cart, by the way? How many have seen a bullock cart? So many have. How many have traveled in a bullock cart? No? <coughs> so I had the privilege in my younger days, living in a small uh, village, where there were mud roads only and bullock carts. Uh, seeing the bullock cart, often catching hold of the driver, pleading with him and sitting nearby, near his seat, <coughs> and enjoying the cart ride. So we had that privilege which you don't have. Of course, our, our generation students, you know, my son, when he was so small, when he was about five, six years old, uh, we took him to the village. And we were, as we were walking along the <coughs> um, field, rice field, he was asking me, what is this green grass which is growing? It was paddy. He had never seen that because we lived in a city. Some of you must be better <laughs> informed, I think. But the, uh, there is a system, there is an indigenous traditional system of break. If you have seen a… and this girl had gone through all the available 
literature. She had picked up from the books uh, that in, in old Harappa and Mohanjo-daro, there was a little cart image made of terracotta, that is uh, uh, <coughs> made of uh, mud, clay. But th that had no break. She had read of uh, the Jataka stories which um, uh, repeat the experiences of uh, Gautama Buddha in his previous births. That's what is called Jataka. And in one of his early births, he was a Bodhisattva who was a merchant, a merchant leader, a caravan leader who owned 500 bullock carts. That story is there. Then there is a story in the Upanishads. This also she had gone through uh, about a <coughs> cart driver called Raikwa, who was uh, known as a great philosopher and the king also wanted to get his advice. Such things about India and Indian roads and Indian carts, she had picked up from the library books. But none of them mentioned anything about the brake system. But <coughs> I was, uh, since I was uh, a stupid uh, village product. I knew that uh, bullock carts have a big, heavy piece of timber uh, which is tied to the back of the bullock cart. It is hanging down. It is tied to the seat and it is very near the big um, wheels. And uh, from that heavy piece of timber, they take a, a piece of coir, a thread, uh, it goes <laughs> below the bullock cart and goes to the front portion uh, <coughs> where the bullocks are and the bullock driver, driver the cart sits. The, that piece of uh, uh, the coir strip, uh, that is there hanging down. And whenever the, the driver wants to apply the brake, he puts his uh, feet down and um, the big timber, the heavy timber goes and pushes, presses against the big wheels of the car. This is an indigenous system of brake which is very effective. Next time you see Bula cart in a village, you can try to observe this. But somehow this girl, he, she didn't know about this, so she, but she had worked out in her mind this problem. I wondered how she came across this because in, in those days our school children never asked questions, never did any project like that but these girls in 1970s <coughs> in London had a system of taking up a project and working it out with the help of their teachers asking questions and trying to get answers. Anyway, this was a revealing experience for me and uh, it showed the defects of our teaching methods. Today, nowadays, you have, uh, I have had such experiences in the school. Uh, one such experience also I will tell you before we go to questions. That is, I had a son who was eight years old. Uh, because we were crazy about our language, mother tongue, Malayalam, in the university campus, we had put him in a Malayalam medium government school. He knew nothing about English, no English <laughs> lessons for him. Uh, but uh, and we had uh, very little time I, after my invitation to go to London. About two months were left. So one of the English ladies who, who was present, uh, she was the wife of a visiting professor in the English department. So she took him uh, to her house for the, uh, whenever she was free and taught him a few words and sentences in English for survival. That was all the capital that he had. So we were <coughs> bothered as to what we could do with him. We had to spend a year there and put him in school. So what kind of uh, study he could without knowing English? <laughs> that was a problem for us. Uh, and uh, the London University authorities were good enough uh, to suggest a school which they called a comprehensive school. I then telephoned the principal of the school and asked him what can I do if uh, this chap 
needs some special tuition, we will arrange for it, we can pay for it. If he needs special books, we will purchase that also because my fellowship was good enough. <coughs> it provided a, a special fund for the child's education. Uh, but the principal just laughed at it. Why do you worry about these things, he said. Uh, and asked me, how did you learn your language, Malayalam? I said, I learned it natural in the natural way. You must have uh, listened to your parents and teachers and elders and playmates. That's how you learn. And that is how people uh, <coughs> learn languages. They are not taught. They simply pick it up. And this was true. And he said, your child, your son will speak and write better English than you within six months. I felt insulted uh, because I, from the very beginning, I had a special liking for the English language, special tuition at home and all that. And uh, I was considered generally very proficient in English. So how could it be that uh, this chap will pick up English language and speak and write it better than me within six months? Anyway, we had to wait and then I learned that since he was eight years old, they put him in the, all the eight-year-old children in the same class. That was their way. There was no textbook, no examination, uh, no special tuition. They had some books, but <coughs> uh, each student had a cubicle in his class where uh, his books were kept, notebooks and uh, other books were kept. Here they were not uh, permitted to take these books home because they believed that when they left the school and went home, the time was for them to enjoy, to play games and mix with other students. That was all. They should not read. They should not go with their textbooks uh, home. And at, at the school, they had to study, but there was no textbook, no examination, nothing like that. Next year, they were all taken to the next class of nine-year students. Next year, to the next class of ten-year students. Then after that, of course, they had the very tough courses and all that. But till they reached the age of ten, there was no classroom, no classes, no examinations, no teaching even. The, on the first day, this child, um, um, he was, I, we asked him as to what he did on the first day. We went to the school and found that the school was very different from our picture of a school, a long shed with uh, benches and desks and blackboard arranged in a particular manner, the teacher having a platform and speaking and all that. He told us that they were all into, uh, <coughs> admitted into a, small, a big room where they had plenty of paper and um, paint boxes and uh, crayons and all that, pencils, everything. And the teacher asked them to draw pictures, <laughs> whatever pictures they wanted. Uh, they could paint, they could draw and paint. After some time, uh, a teacher came to him and asked him what he had uh, drawn, he had painted. He said, I am trying to uh, <coughs> draw the picture of a ship because the school was just on the banks of the river Thames, which you, have, you must have heard of uh, in London. And um, when looking out of the window of the school, of course the school was just like a bungalow, uh, not having um, uh, arranged classrooms and all that. They were sitting or lying on the floor and drawing and painting. Uh, <coughs> He went, uh, he looked out to the window and found a few um, boats and ships in the river. He wanted to paint, <coughs> draw and paint one of them. So the teacher came and asked him what he did. He said, I, I am drawing a ship. Then she sat there with him and um, told him, well, this is the deck of the ship. This is the flag mast. This is the flag flying. And she also drew those things. This is the room, engine room, like that. <coughs> the bow of the ship, 
the deck of the ship and taught him these words. He repeated them and she also drew and he drew and then said, oh, that's okay. Uh, think of um, another subject for tomorrow. And like that she went to uh, one from one student to another. Uh, that was the lesson, that was the only lesson. And even during the heavy winter, when <coughs> many of us uh, felt lazy, not feeling like getting up even if it is eight or nine in the morning, this fellow uh, was, uh, was very eager to go to school. And he, he was very sorry on holidays and Sundays especially because there was no school. He wanted to go to school every day because when they went to school, uh, the teachers uh, took them along the banks of, uh, of the river Thames, took them to cathedrals, museums. Uh, there were so many there and the uh, old palace buildings and all that. Uh, they enjoyed those visits. That was the way they were taught. And then, but uh, after one or two days, he had a bitter experience. One day he came back crying. Uh, he didn't answer his mother's questions. I was very busy with other things. Uh, she asked, she didn't answer. He was very moody, not talkative at all. We didn't uh, know what he suffered from. The next day also went like that. Third day, he told his mother <coughs> um, quietly that as soon as he entered the school, a big boy, big fat black boy, because uh, there were white and black boys in the school, a big black, uh, black uh, boy just ran to him and hit him on the stomach saying Kung Fu. He didn't know what it was, you know, Kung Fu, he said, and hit him on his stomach. He fell down and cried. Nobody came to his help. Uh, and that is why he was very moody. On the third day after that, uh, he came back uh, very happy. So we asked him as to what happened. This fellow was watching the television. In those days in 1974, we didn't have television in India. So it was a new miracle for us. And this fellow was watching the television day and night as far as possible. He had seen on the TV screen, the, there was a particular <coughs> episode in which uh, a boy uh, went and hit other people. They, took, they were taken by surprise, hit them on the stomach crying Kung Fu. And when the other fellow fell down, they were very happy. This fellow had watched it and uh, now he knew the secret. So the next day morning, he went to school, searched for that old uh, enemy of his and uh, gave him a shock treatment, hit him on the stomach. That fellow fell down. And uh, then they enjoyed uh, the scene, other, other uh, students came around and they became friends. Earlier, I had uh, asked him, uh, I had told him that we will complain to the principal uh, about this uh, treatment. He said, no, you shouldn't. He, he didn't permit me to call his principal on the phone and complain about uh, the other fellow's uh, behavior. Because he said, the principal and these uh, rogue children, these uh, rowdies, they together go to the shop and uh, buy chocolates and eat. So why should, <laughs> there is no point in your complaining to the principal about this boy or other boys. They don't listen to such things. Later on, when he had succeeded in hitting the other fellow and making friends with him and his rowdy friends, um, I contacted the principal and the principal said that, yes, this is the way we resolve our problems. We don't interfere with the children, with the ways they behave, they have to settle their problems themselves. If we start intervening, then they become dependent on us uh, everywhere, every time. On the other hand, they will find the solution, make it up among themselves, they are of the same age, same mind, same mischievous turn of mind. So they will find a solution. This is our way, we never interfere in, in their <coughs> small 
disputes. I thought it was a wise and right thing to do, but very often our parents and our teachers don't think like that. I don't know how, how it is in your institution here. So uh, we learned many things in, in, uh, in England for the first time. <coughs> we learned many things about schooling and school children and then school textbooks as I told you. Uh, they, they don't have, have teachers. But when I returned in 1976 to India, that was the emergency period. <coughs> and uh, uh, our Prime Minister, Indira Nehru, wanted us to copy the Soviet style of, of the government preparing textbooks. So for the NCRT, from the, for the for plus two courses in National <coughs> uh, Council of Education Research and Training, uh, she <coughs> suggested that for the first time in India, the government has to prepare textbooks, including subjects, in, uh, subjects like history. And she appointed a, an editorial board. I was also a member of that board. We were about four or five historians there. We doubted very much whether the Soviet style is good for India or not. We, did. we had the feeling that it was not good. But since it was emergency, since the Prime Minister wanted it, we thought we will experiment with it. So our <laughs> editorial board uh, selected some good historians and requested them, because we went on uh, working it out. And today we find that after many, many decades, those textbooks which we prepared for the plus two courses in history, ancient history by R.S. Sharma, medieval history by uh, Satish Chandra, and modern history by Bipan Chandra, <laughs> these textbooks are taken up for study, for the competitive courses, not for the plus two courses only, for higher courses also in many schools and colleges. Well, uh, that was something new for us. But one thing, when we prepared these textbooks, uh, when there was a change of government, the next uh, government uh, that, that uh, which was led by the BJP, they rejected these books, introduced their own books. When the Congress came back to power, they reintroduced these books and with slight changes here and there, uh, <coughs> these books are still there on the market and perhaps some of the good uh, books for history at that level and even for a higher level. Well, let me stop now and invite your questions.